Welcome to a conversation with a community leader. This is sponsored by Leadership Kitsap, and I am your host, Kerry Bozeman. I was a former mayor of Bellevue and Bremerton, Washington. And my guest today is Eric Stevens, the executive director of the Humane Society of Kitsap County. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Kerry. And I will, I will uh, divulge that you and I are old friends. Yes. And that actually I was on your board at the Kitsap Humane Society. You were. So I'm a big fan of the Kitsap Humane Society. And my wife and I have this wonderful cat that, that we love dearly. So I understand what animals do for people. Yeah. So let's start our conversation just uh, telling, sharing with the folks a little bit about yourself, Eric. Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Sure. That's well, I actually thing. grew up in New York City yeah. uh, and went to college there, but right after college. Where'd you go to college? Uh, Queens College. It was part of the City University Commuter School. Uh-huh. So you, didn't, I you weren't in some fraternity then? <laughs> 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 no, no. I, I, I lived at home and... Uh, What'd your I, dad do? What'd your dad my do? My dad was a pretty successful kind of corporate business guy. And I had this idea when I was in college that I'd go follow in his footsteps and I studied economics, went to Stanford Business School. Oh. Uh, but then around that time in my early 20s, I said, you know, I, that's not really my goal. And uh, I did a little stint uh, as a VISTA volunteer, including working on oh. an Indian reservation in the Southwest. And after those experiences, I said, you know, I w I'd like to do something that's more in the helping professions so that, that was so the beginning. So rather than being in the financial market or something like that, you wanted to work in public service. Yes. And that you found that calling pretty soon in life, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I went through that same sort know, of thing. I know, we've talked about that. Yeah. 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 So what, uh, tell me a little bit about what you did before you came to Kitsap County in terms of work. Uh, well, I have now, including the current stint as executive director, I was counting up, I've been in the nonprofit world for almost 40 years, mm. uh, 33 of which I've been an executive director. I ran a child development organization. Where was that? For, uh, Minneapolis for 20 mm. years. And then I ran Did you like Minneapolis? I loved Minneapolis. It's so isn't it cold in the winter and hot in the summer? It's brutally cold. Brutally cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's why we moved back out here. I love yeah. the climate here. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I've been to Minneapolis a couple of times. And beautiful, wonderful city. But boy, I mean, the time I was there, the humidity was just Oh, yeah. Awful. Summer, summers can be brutal also. Summer just brutal. Yeah, so yeah. you were running big... Yeah, so I, ra I ran uh, the Child Development Organization, and then I ran an organization that was rehabilitation for people with physical disabilities. Uh, that uh, that takes dedication. Yeah, it does. It does. And I think just nonprofit work in general takes dedication oh, because... Yeah. You know, you're always trying to s scrap together a budget that works. Right. Never have enough money. Yeah. Provide always, us. There's always more services needed yeah, than you can provide. Yeah, right. I've been through that. Right. Right. So I, at some point in my career, I, uh, in a way, moved away from a specific content area like early childhood education and really started specializing in organizational leadership and consulting mm -hmm. to nonprofits. And initially... I stepped into the Humane Society seven and a half years ago when there were some issues that needed uh, fixing, and I came in initially as an interim executive director. Well, you're getting ahead of me a little bit. Okay. What brought you to <laughs> then? You were doing your work in uh, Minneapolis, yeah, yeah. doing nonprofit right. work, running organizations. Right. Decided maybe I'd rather be a consultant rather than to I, run the day to day I, stuff. I, that's true. I decided that. Yeah and spent about seven years uh, full-time. I had my own practice, uh -huh. and I worked with nonprofit leaders and nonprofit boards, and during that time, I had probably about 60 to 70 uh, clients. Wow, that's uh, a big client yeah. list. I did some of that myself, but I found that every time I'd go in to work with an organization or help, I wanted to stay yeah. and solve the problem. Well, and the other thing as a consultant, you're, you're in there for a short period of time. Yeah. And there's a great satisfaction from working with the people in the organization. You the miss being part of a team. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the, the team is, is a big, big thing for so me. So what brought you to Kitsap County? Right. Um, in my 20s, we had lived in Washington State and oh. then moved to Minnesota. 
But I, always I recall you lived in the Yakima area. Yeah, we did. We lived uh, four years in Yakima, two years in Ellensburg, one year in the Aberdeen Hoquiam area. Oh, I we know that area. We decided to well. move to the Midwest uh, because my wife is from there. Landed in Minnesota, uh, but we always had a hankering to come back. Loved the the climate, you know. Loved mm -hmm. the water. Loved the mountains. You know, it's funny. People, most people migrate to the Northwest uh -huh. that I know. They uh -huh. came here from somewhere else, yeah. but they never leave. Right. And I find our winters are hard here. I mean, they're oh. cloudy. They're not real cold, but they're cloudy and, and a little depressing sometimes. Yeah. But people never leave here. Well, I'll tell you, after I think it's the beauty of the place. That's absolutely true. But after living in Minnesota for 30 years, I do not find the winters here harsh oh, or cold. Oh, I'm sure not. <laughs> well, I they're mild. In. You can actually garden here 12 months around. Well, you can. You can. <laughs> So, what then? What brought you to Kitsap County? Uh, the beauty. Oh, yeah. So you did you move out here without a job? Uh, I did. I had already started my own consulting practice, mm. and um, I figured I'd figure it out. I joined a consulting firm in Seattle for about three years, then went out on my own, and then. I I, uh, there was a job opening. I did fundraising for the Bloedel Reserve oh yeah, on, on Bainbridge. Bainbridge Island for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And you live on Bainbridge, I right? I do. I do. Did you live, when you first came out here, did you move to Bainbridge? Yeah, we, 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 we bought some property and yeah. built a house. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So you're in Kitsap County, you're doing consulting work, that sort of thing, and, all, and you're at Bloedel. What got you interested in being the director of the Humane yeah. Society? Well, initially, I got recruited uh, and because they were looking for an interim executive director on short notice. Right. And I happened to just leave my job at Bloedel like about two weeks before that. So it was an interesting opportunity, and I had never, I'd run organizations before. I'd been an interim one time before. I'd never, I'd always have animals in my life but never worked in animal welfare. Mm -hmm. But I figured I could bring some skill to running an organization and figuring out some of the issues that they were dealing with, including financial. So the first couple of years that I was there, we were spending uh, rebuilding the Kitsap Humane Society. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, things started to take off. Uh, in I'll go back to when you came. Yeah. I, I'm aware yeah. that the Humane Society was having pretty severe yeah. financial difficulty. We were. Yeah. It was. How'd so you turn that around? Uh, we um, cut the budget. We <coughs> went out to the community, to our donors. We were very transparent about what was going on. We recruited a whole new board of directors mm -hmm. to help us. And we just, uh, you know, kind of put ourselves to the grindstone for a couple of years to work through it. But at the same time, we felt really passionately about the animals and the animal welfare mission. So when we cut the budget, we wanted to make sure that it was not going to harm our basic care for the animals. And I think we, after a couple of years, we started to demonstrate to the community that we were doing a good job, started to promote more of what we were doing. We started getting more support, and things have taken off from there so in a big way. So you you turned the organization around in a very difficult well, time. We, we did. Yeah, we yeah, did. Yeah. That's right. Your yeah. board yeah. and your staff. Yeah. Those were difficult times. They, they were. They yeah. Were. But one thing I've always felt about uh, humane societies is there's no one more passionate about supporting an organization than people who own and love animals. Would you say that's true? Well, I absolutely. Mean, I worked for the Boys and Girls Club right. for right. 30 years. I mean, people and I are have to say. Animal lovers are even maybe more passionate <laughs> about... People are crazy about their animals. And if you think about it, first of all, it's pretty fascinating that we can have this relationship and connection and even communication with a whole other species, right? Right. And, we, and through that bond that we establish with the, the animals that become our, our pets, they become members of our family, we love them. So people absolutely feel really attached to animals. And then beyond that, they see that so many, in our case, uh, in our community, thousands of animals are homeless. They are, need our support, and it just strikes people's heartstrings. So, A, people love animals, but they also want to help rescue animals in need. Yeah. And that's really, I think, the foundation. Uh, 
So for people who don't never been to the Humane Society, don't know anything about it, what's the mission? What's the operation look like yeah, at the Humane Society? Yeah. Well, our mission, I mean, it really starts with rescuing animals in need. We are rescuing uh, stray animals, abandoned animals. We take in, in Kitsap County, about 3,000 stray animals a year. Wow. We're also there for families who, one reason or another, can no longer take care of their pets. Let's say a military uh, family mm. is transferred and they can't bring their animal with them, right? Let's say you have a senior whose health is declining and they're no longer able to take care of their animal. We have about 1,500 animals a year on, on average are surrendered to the Humane Society. We also help rescue so animals. So 1,500 yeah, yeah. people each year yeah, that can families, yeah. that decide they can no longer take care of their animal right. and bring it into you. Right. So it must be sad for them. It is. It is. It must be emotional. It is very emotional. And uh, it just, it, there's a, a big part of our work is being very tuned in to that powerful connection that people have with their animals. And if someone has to let go of their animal, it's a huge thing. And we try to find ways, if possible, to... Uh, help people if there's any way someone can not surrender their animal I'll give you one example it's one of our new programs which we call our pet protection program let's say you have a short-term crisis in your life let's say you're a senior you're single at this point widowed widower and you have to go into the hospital for some medical care and you mm -hmm. don't have anybody that's gonna in your circle that's gonna take take care of this animal that your pet we can help, we can mm. uh, step in, provide a temporary foster care arrangement until you're able to get out of the hospital, get back to your home and take care of your pet. Let's say you're a woman who is a victim of domestic abuse and you have to find a safe harbor for a period of time, but you know, your pet is so important in your life. You mm -hmm. don't have to give that pet up. We can find, we can find a foster home and help so you. So you actually that. go out and find someone else that's willing to take this animal in a foster care situation. Yeah, we have. So you have a lot of people that sign up for that program? Y you know, we have a huge uh, support from volunteers in foster homes. We have, I just learned the other day, uh, 421 regular volunteers. Wow. 200 plus foster homes. We now have a new program where people can come into the shelter and take pets out for a shelter break. We call it kicking it with canines, uh -huh. with dogs specifically. We have almost 200 people that have signed up for that already. We have a lot of people that just come and walk dogs, right? Well, yes. Uh, among our 420 volunteers are an amazing number of dedicated dog walkers. And, yeah. they, you know, people, again, they love animals and they care about animals. So it's a way to come and make a difference. They feel good. They enjoy that connection to the animal. You can see the animals perk up. I mean, they've come to the shelter in most cases pretty distressed, right? Yeah, traumatized. Yeah, and often. Yeah. And it may take a while for a pet to regain some trust. So that human animal interaction that happens in the early days when they come into the shelter is so, so important. And we have our dedicated staff and volunteer who love the animals, but they also know how to handle those animals, especially Let's say a dog. You have to train these volunteers? Absolutely. Every, every volunteer goes through training. Oh, yeah. well, that's a big job. By it's itself. a big job, yeah. You Especially with 400 volunteers. 400 <laughs> volunteers. Right. So we have a full time volunteer coordinator who recruits and, and uh -huh. uh, helps train, yeah. Uh -huh. that's, am that's amazing. Yeah. So the mi in describing the mission, you, uh, the organization's called, is it called No Kill? No. Well, can I just go back a second? Yeah. Uh, we have a tagline that I think really does the best job of describing our mission, which is rescue, rehabilitate, rehome. Rescue, rehabilitate, and rehome. Yeah, and so the rescue part I think I've already described. Animals coming in, uh, stray, surrendered, or, or we rescue animals from other shelters where they don't have the adoption pool or the adoption service or the mm -hmm. uh, specialized services that we do. Mm -hmm. Bring them up here what we call our Rescue Me program and adopt them out. Mm -hmm. So the first part is rescue. The rehabilitate, about a third of the animals that come into the shelter have some type of a special need. Uh, it's either a medical issue, which could be something minor like an upper respiratory infection or something pretty major like a broken leg. Maybe that while they were a stray animal, they got hit by a car. Mm -hmm. uh, what know, if they're uh, l like a dog and they're just, yeah. they're 
they're nest, kind of nasty, and yeah. you don't want them around children and yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. What do you do with that kind of a Sure. Animal? Well, uh, two things I want to say about that. I think for the va 90... They're, they're angry or Yeah, 98% of the dogs that come in, and even if they have some behavior issue, I think with the love, with the attention, no. with some training, we can get them to a place where they're pretty, you know, much more adoptable. And in some cases, we may look for a special adopter and say, you know, this dog really shouldn't be in a family with children. Yeah. But someone who has experience and has a fence yard and doesn't have kids would be a perfect match for that, for that dog. Uh, there, are, there are situations. It's, it's, it's rare. I mean, it's, it's, I wouldn't say rare, but it's very, very limited. We, you know, we're not going to adopt dangerous dogs out into the community. No. So in some cases, we are humanely euthanizing no. animals that are either too dangerous to be adopted out or too sick to be rehabilitated medically. And it's really the more humane. Well, that gets to the, uh, you're, you're normally, you're not, in the old days, people would take their animals to the Humane Society to get rid of them, right? And Humane <laughs> Societies would euthanize them and put them away. And you don't do that. Right. That is the old days. That's, That's the, the day old days. of dog pounds. Right. Dog pounds. I mean, in this community, in this shelter at Kitsap Humane Society, if you go back 25 years, and it was all over the country, we were euthanizing over half the pets that came in. That's uh, amazing. For the last four years, we've had uh, what we call a save rate of 96% wow. or better. Last year, we hit 97%. That's got to be one of the highest in the country. It is it? one of the highest in the country. Isn't that amazing? It's, we were proud of that. Well, I happen to know you have a, a terrific veterinary staff. <laughs> we right? do. And you have a great doctor out there. Yeah, Dr. Jen Stonequist. Dr. Jen, who, who I've heard or seen or she will stay overnight <laughs> with an animal when the animal's sick uh, and sleep on the floor with them. Well, I have to say, uh, uh, all of our staff, and Dr. Jen certainly among them, are, are really dedicated, and they care so well, much. Well, you'd have to be to work Yeah, with. and, and they will go extra miles because so many of the pets need that extra love and care and rehabilitation, medical care, behavior training in those first few weeks uh -huh. to get them back on What's track. What's the average stay of an sure. animal? Uh, the average stay would be about two weeks. There's oh. a whole bunch of animals that come in that we can adopt out within a matter of days. They're ready well, to go. I know you've got a really good website. Right. My wife went on it last night because we were talking about this meeting today. And she saw this picture of this <laughs> little kitten. And she said, oh, yeah. maybe we ought to go <laughs> adopt that. But I said, that cat will be gone in about two hours. Uh, we do have a lot of animals flying out the door because, you know, look, we, we have a lot of people want to adopt animals. We have a great website. They come to the shelter, uh, they fall in love, and, uh, but some animals, because they need more care or they just need to get to a point where they're ready for adoption, either medically or with their distress, mm -hmm. uh, there'll be a whole group of animals that might be more three weeks, four weeks, up to two months. But we never, ever euthanize an animal just because, well, we haven't been able to adopt it out yet. No. If it's a question of that they're a healthy animal, it can take three months, four months. I think so many people are in our community are well, familiar with the story of Fats, who took, uh, what, about 12 months to adopt out? But you adopted one of your own animals, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, was, uh, he was distressed. Yeah. And he needed a loving home and consistency. And, you know, six years later, People who met him when we first brought him home, including our veterinarian and friends, say, boy, he has really changed. And I think, you know, the love, the consistency, the direction sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, animals want that from their humans, mm -hmm. and they give so much back. Yeah. You know, you, you see, uh, in my neighborhood, I see people walking their dogs all the time, um, and older people, women, men, kids, all that. Is there a, uh, what's the most popular sought after animal, dog? Oh, uh, well, you know, I. <laughs> if you had c one come in the, uh, in, the, in the shelter and it'd go the uh, next hour. Well, we have a t-shirt mm. that says rescue is the best breed. Yeah. 
And the reality is, yeah, we'll occasionally get a breed dog in. We get a lot of smaller ch Chihuahua, Terrier mixes, for example. Those are popular, right? Those are popular. But 95% of the dogs who come in are mixed breed, and they tend to be healthier. Um, and we just you call know, those the, mutts, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, yeah. and uh, people love them. Yeah. Yeah. So how big is Humane Society in terms of staff and budget? Right. And, and how do you support that budget? Uh, uh, you're, you're not tax supported, right? You're not a, you're a nonprofit. We're a, we're a 501c3 right. nonprofit. Uh, we have about 70 staff, uh, paid staff, wow. mostly full-time, some part-time. That's a big organization. Uh, we're heading up toward about a $4 million annual budget. And just to put it in perspective, uh, seven years ago during this period of uh, mm. turmoil, <coughs> we had to cut our budget all the way down back to about $2 million. Wow. But we've grown. We are taking in the last four years on average over 6,500 animals per year. That's mm. huge. Uh, and I said we're That's finding homes. Is that a big humane society in terms of national humane societies or average or? Uh, I would put us in the medium to large category. In some of your larger cities, you will have humane societies that are taking in 10, 15, 20,000 animals. And sometimes you take in animals from other shelters. Yeah, yeah. Last year we took in over 2,000 animals from other shelters. And the issue there is they're in other shelters, as I mentioned, that don't have the adoption customer mm. base and they don't have the medical and behavior care. So if they're not transferred out of those other shelters to, to partners like us, uh, most of those animals are going to get euthanized. So we're rescuing over 2,000 animals a year and giving them a chance at life that they wouldn't have elsewhere. Yeah. So I was very familiar with your facilities. Yeah. Long, you know, when I first <laughs> when I first got you know joined the Such board they are. and all that, and I just thought, wow, you know, eventually you're going to have to replace this facility. So it was uh, it was t it was tired and old, Eric. So let's talk. I know you're on a capital campaign to rebuild the facilities for the Humane Society. Yes, we desperately. What are you building, and how are you raising the money? We desperately needed new facilities. They were too small. They were, for example, our. Uh, dog adoption area, dog kennels, felt like an old dog pound, uh, not enough room for the animals, uh, overcrowded, noisy. No, no place to wash and dry things. And, uh, everything I, everything I've was been overflowing. Through your facility. Right. Was so we started a capital campaign after a considerable uh, planning. We started planning in 2015 and we started and a campaign. A capital in campaign is a is a huge. effort to raise private sector funding, right? Correct. We have uh, raised over six million dollars. Wow, and that's I'm a big <laughs> campaign in Kitsap County. Yes, and we still have more to go, but I'm excited to say that really in a matter of weeks, probably early September, we're going to open our new 9,500 square foot pet adoption center. Wow. And it's going to be fabulous. It's almost done. It's going to be much better housing for the animals. They're going to come in. They're going to have more space in their kennels. Uh, a beautiful place for uh, ad prospective adopters to come in. Mm -hmm. Right now, if you come in on a busy Saturday, the lobby uh, is crowded. I've been in there on a busy <laughs> Saturday, and yeah. it's crammed and it crowded, is. and it people is. are waiting out the door. So this is going to be a huge improvement. Right. But also, we're so excited about that. As I mentioned, we'll be, do we'll be announcing some grand openings probably around early September. But it's not the end. We have two more pieces. Uh, our immediate next phase is to do some partial renovation in our old building and create and remodel and create a new behavior training center for the animals, which we desperately need. We don't have adequate space for that. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, we are going to, our current plans is, are to add another wing on to the facility on the other side that would be new expanded veterinary wing. And the overall campaign is called our pet life-saving campaign. Uh, so we feel we're about two-thirds the way through, but these other pieces, the behavior and the veterinary, are, which are still out in front of us, are, are critically important to, to complement this new pet mm -hmm. adoption center. We need those life-saving components, the medical and behavior, to make the adoption work. Mm -hmm. So the capital campaign's going on. I know you lead the capital yeah. campaign. You're, yeah. a, you're a terrific fundraiser, one of the best I've ever met. 
So congratulations Thank to you. Thank you, Carrie. Can people still uh, assume, still donate to the campaign, and how would they do that? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know we you are. are. We have to get every dollar we need to fully pay for this pet adoption center that we're opening in less than two months. We are about $85,000 away. And we've wow. just launched what we call our move-in campaign. And we would love for people to either send in donations, go on our website, or contact us. Because if you're interested in uh, giving a gift, we'll take you on a personal tour of the new building. And uh, then we'll be continuing to raise funds after that for these other components I mentioned. Are there still some naming gift opportunities where you get your, if you give a sizable gift, you get your name on a part of the building? Absolutely, yes. What, what, are, you, what are those? What well, are those they range things? from naming kennels to naming rooms or putting your name on one of the new buildings for a million dollars. <laughs> okay, did you hear that? There's somebody out there that probably can't wait to write that. <laughs> Since can't you wait, asked. <laughs> can't wait to write that right, check. Right, But we've, I just want to say, I mean, there have been many, many people in the community, uh, certainly a lot of the uh, donors and volunteers and even staff who are near and dear to us who have reached out and given so generously in such a caring way. So I just want to say how grateful we are to all the people in the community who are supporting okay, our work. We're about ready to wrap up here, and this okay. program's about leadership. Uh, Eric, short, uh, quickly, what what is your leadership style? <laughs> uh, I, it's very important for me to, to listen to the staff, to that, the volunteers. That's a, that's a lost characteristic for most people. Yeah, and I can't I, say. I, I meet very yeah. few good listeners. Yeah, because everybody has important perspectives. And sometimes you don't fully get the picture of what's going on or what's needed. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you one example. When we were speaking. No, nope. you got to move along Okay, here. okay. Uh, so you listen before you act, right? Yeah, and, and, and I think you have to communicate really clearly what your expectations are, right. what your vision is, right. how you're going to get there. Uh, and you have to engage people. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Well. You, uh, what I like to say about people like you, Eric, is you, you're going to leave it better than you found it. Thank you. And that's a perp that's a mission in uh, the pe in lives in in our life that we, you, people like you, uh, do. Well, if you lead a nonprofit, you really have to believe in and care about the work that you're doing. And you've grown in this uh, since you've been there. You, you become an animal expert. You weren't that before, but you are now. <laughs> well, I've learned a lot, and, yeah. I, and I've learned a lot from our staff and volunteers, and I've learned a lot about the trends in animal welfare, yeah. I enjoyed having our conversation, Eric. Uh, congratulations on your capital campaign. Thank you so much. You do more. So this has been a conversation with a community leader. It was a pleasure to sit with Eric today. We wish the Humane Society the best in their capital campaign. Uh, this is Kerry Bozeman supporting Leadership Kitsap, and we'll see you next time with another community leader. Leadership Kitsap is our community's civic leadership program. Leadership Kitsap fosters and empowers educated, prepared, and engaged community leaders. For over 25 years, we have cultivated leaders that work collaboratively to create positive change dedicated to making our community a better place to work and live. We expose our class to Kitsap's leaders across public, private, and nonprofit sectors. We are happy to bring many of the conversations with these leaders to you. Strong leaders build strong communities.